So hi, I'm, I'm Doug Schmidt. I'm a computer science professor here at Vanderbilt. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how I've been applying ChatGPT in one of the courses, actually two of the courses that I'm teaching this semester. The courses are very similar. And so I started to get into this about four weeks ago. And so what you're seeing here is really hot off the press examples of using this technology in a Vanderbilt class. The class that I teach focuses on developing and testing things called microservices, which are ways of taking computation and splitting them up so they can run in a web-based environment, the kind of things we use all the time when we check our credit card balance or we go to Amazon and make purchases and so on. And nowadays, because of the fact we've got so much computation, it's important to know how to take advantage of all that computation effectively. And these computations can run on mobile devices, smartphones, laptops, desktops, tablets, cloud servers, and so on and so forth. And you can find out more about my class if you click on the link at the bottom of the slides, which we'll provide later. So right now in this semester, we're developing a movie recommendation system where people type in movies that they've seen and then the system will tell them what movies they might like to see. If you've used Netflix or Amazon Prime or you have a Fire Stick, you've undoubtedly seen something quite a bit like this. So what I've been really focusing on is how I can use ChatGPT to make me a more effective teacher, make my, my lectures more interesting, make my assignments more interesting, make me more interesting. And what I've, what I've found is what I'll be describing here, but I found just in a nutshell, it's, it's been tremendously effective at making me a lot more productive and I think hopefully more in, enjoyable for my students. So one of the things I've done, uh, I've been an expert at, at concurrent programming, which means how do you run multiple operations at the same time, taking advantage of modern multi-core processors. I've done this for, for quite a long time and my classes had a lot of that characteristic. However, there were gaps in my own background, my own education. For example, I didn't have much experience with database programming. I didn't have much experience developing server-side application com capabilities using modern web application platforms. So up to this point, up to the last couple of weeks, when I had a, an issue there, I would go see my friends like Jules and say, Jules, can you help me figure out how to do this? Well, that obviously doesn't scale very well. But what I've been able to use ChatGPT for is to learn these techniques that I was missing and then be able to teach those topics to my students much more rapidly. So for example, what I can do now is I can use ChatGPT to give natural language prompts saying, I would like to generate a database query method that will find all the movies in a database whose title contains words in a string. And ChatGPT can take that and generate the exact piece of code that I need in order to get my system to do that, which is great because I didn't really know how to do that before. Likewise, I can also go a little deeper. I could say, hey, ChatGPT, what's the actual underlying SQL query that this method that you generated for me is performing under the hood. And boom, it'll instantly generate the code. So I not only know how to program it, but I also understand what's going on behind the scenes, which makes me have a deeper understanding of this piece of technology that up to this point, I was really a novice at. What I can also do is generate sample code that I can use to show my students how to do their assignments using advanced techniques I wasn't even aware of until just a few weeks ago. So for example, one of the things you can do is you can have ChatGPT generate custom queries that don't get, they don't correspond to things you can do by just using natural language descriptions to generate query methods or SQL statements, but you can actually get it to write code to do the work for you, which is fantastic because I had no idea how to do that. I could also have it generate the other various minutia that's needed to make my software run properly, like import statements to bring in the right libraries. I can get it to comment my code. One of the things that most developers tend to not like doing is writing comments, which is why so much code is hard to read because nobody takes time to document it. But ChatGPT can actually read your code and generate very descriptive comments, which you're then welcome to refine and improve if you want. But I find it makes it much less painful to document my code, which is really important for my students to understand what's going on. And then it can also generate other somewhat minutia things that are very low level details, the type of dependencies that my code has on libraries that need to be brought into my project in order to run it in a particular interactive development environment. What's interesting about ChatGPT is, as Jesse pointed out, it was trained for information as of about uh, September 2021. And so newer things that have happened since then, it's often not aware of. 
And we'll talk a bit more about that when we talk about how to use ChatGPT effectively in your courses. But sometimes it'll, it'll be missing some things. So what do you do in that case? It's like Jules' example about taking a swag at a, taking a, a hit on a stone as a stonemason. You go back and use other tools like normal Google search to fill in the blanks that ChatGPT doesn't know about. Another thing I use it for is oftentimes my students will submit really clever solutions to my assignments. And at first glance, it's not even clear to me what they're trying to do. So now all I need to do is I simply feed their clever solutions into ChatGPT and boom, it comes back and gives me a description of what their code is doing. And then I'm like, oh, of course that's what that's doing. But sometimes they'll be using older versions of the languages we're programming in or older versions of libraries. And I might want to update things to the modern versions. Once again, I simply take the code and I tell ChatGPT, please regenerate this code I gave you, but using a modern way of doing things. And again, within seconds, as Jules' example of the, the recipes and so on, it generates modern code using the most advanced features that are available. And what's also nice is it can do this in multiple programming languages. One of the real challenges, just like in everyday life with human languages, we have lots of different programming languages to convey our intent to computers. Some of them are very familiar. I'm a Java programmer, for example, but I don't really know Python very well. However, with ChatGPT, I can simply ask it, please generate the code that you spit out for me in Java, but do it in Python. And boom, I get the Python version. That's a pretty popular language, so I could probably find a student to do it for me. But what if I'm using a language that's not as popular, more esoteric, like Ada, which was developed for the Department of Defense back in the 1980s? I can ask it to generate Ada code. It would be very, 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 very hard for me to find anybody at Vanderbilt who would know how to generate Ada code at this point. It'd be hard to find most people in general. But if I needed it, ChatGPT knows how to do it. So once again, huge productivity boost. One of the other important things with computing is making sure that the examples are correct. It's not enough to just generate code, but you have to make sure that it works. So you can also get ChatGPT to generate tests to make sure your code works. And it's usually pretty straightforward to figure out whether the tests are correct, because you can run them and look at the output and convince yourself that ChatGPT isn't leading you astray. I can also use it, and I do use it quite a bit, to help explain subtle concepts when students ask me questions about topics, and I'm maybe a little bit unclear, what exactly is that dif distinction? ChatGPT can be used to go in and, and give me some deeper understanding. And, and best of all, it'll actually generate examples because I often find, at least from my learning style, if I can see an example, that helps me understand better how to understand it myself and how to explain it to other people. So it's fantastically useful in that respect. So what are some, some general strategies that I've found thus far in the past month using ChatGPT effectively in teaching Vanderbilt computer science courses. So what I decided to do very early on was to encourage my students rather than discourage them from using ChatGPT in our course. There's a lot of hand-wringing going on in academia and beyond for good reason about how can we deal with this brand new way of generating information, generating output, generating creative uh, artifacts. Some people want to pretend like it's not there. Other people like myself are trying to embrace it to see how we can use it effectively to be more productive and most importantly, how to train our students to be more insightful and also more productive and get them ready for the brave new world of tomorrow where people are going to be using these technologies in everything that they do. So some of the things that are very pragmatic, we have to rethink the way in which we do course assessments. How do we do assignments? How do we do tests, quizzes, exams, and so on? And just pretending like ChatGPT doesn't exist or going to extreme lengths to try to make it impossible to use it isn't always the most effective approach. For example, I could have all my tests done in class with a pencil and paper, but that's really not the way that people write programs. And so it's not a good assessment of whether students are, are prepared for, for the real world, with your, be it in academia or industry. So one thing I'm doing to try to address this is I make my assignments deliberately more open-ended. I give people specifications in English, and then I encourage them to use ChatGPT to try to figure out how to implement those natural language expressions in the form of comments or specifications in a way that will actually compile and run in the environment and pass the test cases. And that's precisely how people are going to be using this in practice. They're going to be using it as a tool to facilitate or augment human cognition.
So this is very representative of how I think this is going to work in everyday life. But ChatGPT doesn't always generate exactly the right code, so they have to figure out how to adapt it and adjust it, just the way that Jules talked about in terms of the example from, from the speech pathology. You, you don't just take it at its, at its face value, but you go on and you do some refinements and revisions. I'm also making my quizzes and exams harder. I'm, I'm doing everything electronically, so it's easy for students to get caught up in the enthusiasm and, and use ChatGPT in, in ways perhaps they shouldn't. So one way I'm trying to address this is making my quizzes and exams more contextual. They come from discussions that we have in class rather than things that can be easily looked up through ChatGPT for information that it has been able to glean from reading all kinds of sources over the past many years. So ask about things that we did in class, ask about assignments where there's really no easy way to look that up on the internet or through ChatGPT. I also have found that by using more modern techniques in my classes and my examples, that also is effective because ChatGPT has a cutoff date of September 2021. And so things that occurred before that point, uh, or sorry, after that point, it doesn't know about. So I've been updating my assignments and my teaching to use the latest and greatest versions of things, which is good for a couple reasons. It forces me to be modern. It teaches my students things that are going to be cutting edge. And it also makes it hard for ChatGPT to just give them the solution lock, stock, and barrel without thinking through the, the actual subtleties. A couple other things I really focus on, it's super important for students to understand both the benefits and the limitations of tools like ChatGPT. And we have to be very upfront about this. Uh, to Jesse's earlier point, if you have training sets that are well-defined, and there's lots of examples, for example, popular programming languages or popular platforms like Android or iOS or Spring. ChatGPT does a really nice job often of giving you examples that are correct and efficient and so on. However, if you start getting off the beaten path, you'll find out that ChatGPT begins to hallucinate, which is just a somewhat whimsical way of saying it'll generate a lot of nonsense very quickly. And ChatGPT, one of the things you have to get used to is it'll give you the wrong answers just as quickly and enthusiastically as it gives you the correct answers. And in that respect, it, it reminds me, I'm sure many of you have really smart friends who are great at some subject, that maybe they're great mathematicians or great programmers or great philosophers, but they may not have a breadth of knowledge in every area, but they're so confident and enthusiastic when they give you a response it sounds like they know what they're talking about, even when they're just speculating and making things up. So I find that you have to view ChatGPT like that friend, where they know a lot about certain things, but they will sometimes pretend to know about things they don't know about. And you have to always be a little skeptical and uh, do some double checking, use other sources, which is just a good habit for us to get into in general. So to kind of wrap up this part, I think it's very, very clear based on the month I've spent using this technology that the current notion of software development, where we do everything, mostly thing, things manually, is going to be replaced or is in the process of being replaced by one in which people, like me and my students and my colleagues, and AI tools like ChatGPT are trustworthy collaborators that can be used to work together to rapidly evolve software-reliant systems based on higher level specifications of intent. And I think that's one of the things we're really thinking through at Vanderbilt in the computer science program is how do we do this effectively? How do we balance the need to get people fundamentals and then teach them these tools that can make them much more productive? And you can read more about this at the link at the bottom of the slide. In fact, throughout my slides, I had links to various other sources you might want to take a look at. So with that, I will pass the baton back over to Jesse.